Greetings from the Spokesman Review Media Suite. My name is Dave Nichols, and this is the Press Box Podcast. See, I got it out right this, this time. Uh, I am joined today by the voice of Eastern Washington University, Larry Weir. Larry, thanks for coming into the studio today. Thanks, Dave. And I'm the one that you can blame for having the problems with the Press Box podcast because I named it about seven years ago. Exactly. <laughs> Larry was my predecessor for this thing. Um, I was uh, um, coerced, uh, cajoled, uh, guilted into taking over as host. But uh, I have Larry to thank for that. So, that Larry, thank you for quitting and making me the host of this thing. <laughs> Anything I can do to make your day harder, Dave, uh -huh. I'm, I'm happy, to be do, happy to be here to do that. Well, I appreciate that. Um, <laughs> let's talk about the actual podcast for a second, because you were the original host of this thing, um, and we're doing it differently than when you did it. You, When you were the podcast, this was a traditional, you know, down in your mother's basement uh, recording podcast where you were home, you had folks call into it. Um, you know, there was no, re no reason to take a shower in the morning to get it done. But, um, but now we're doing this video podcast along with the traditional podcast. So let's talk about the differences there that, that, uh, um, that, that you're going old school podcasting, if there's such a thing, to what we're doing now. Yeah, it, it's completely different. If I'd had to come down here every day out of the week you to wouldn't do have done this, it? it wouldn't have been done. So, uh, you yeah, know, that was the concession they made, I think, to get me to do it was I could do it from home and there wasn't any video. It was more of a, a radio show and radio is what I've done for, right. for years and years and years. So, uh, you know, I, I'm happy to see it back, number one, uh, and I'm happy to see it back in a different format. You know, now people can, I don't know whether people want to see me for a <laughs> 20, 20, 30 minute interview, whatever it is, right. but, you know, here I am. So, ta-da. It's, uh, it's shocking to me, and, and perhaps it shouldn't be with the, um, just the saturation of media uh, in our lives now, that that, and this is going to be a bad thing to say selling the show, but that somebody would sit there, and not just somebody, but the number of people that sit there and watch this. And it's easy enough for a podcast just to, you know, put it on in the background or whatever, but to, for a video podcast, people are actually going to sit and watch this, and that still amazes me a little bit. I think there will be a fair amount of people that do, but I think there will be maybe as many or more who will – you know, go about the the duties of their day mm -hmm. while they're still getting the audio, especially when they figure out that we're not, you know, throwing in highlights and we're not, you know, doing B-roll of something going on. It's right. just it's you and me sitting here talking to one another. Right. And and we were we were contemplating the idea of being able to punch pictures in and whatnot, but it just it got to be the mechanics of it. You know, we had to we, we wrestled with the the post end production, you know, how long it would take to get these episodes up against me trying to sit here and press buttons as I'm talking and responding to folks. So um, it is more um, geared towards um, the radio aspect of it. And and being a radio guy, and you know, I did my first four years in this business as a radio guy too. It it podcasting is is an extension of radio, right? And 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 it has brought the spoken word to go along with the written word um, to a new generation of folks that don't even don't even have a concept of listening to the radio anymore, really. Yeah, and you know, we we I'm I'm running into this more and more as I work with young sportscasters. They grew up watching games on TV. Or, they or be, on their phone. Yeah, or on, on their phone. Um, but they didn't listen to radio to understand that there's a, a difference between radio TV and uh, uh, radio play-by-play -play and TV play-by-play. -play. Radio right. has to be much more descriptive because you can't see what's going on. Whereas in TV, you can see what's going on. You've got to say who's got the ball occasionally, but you don't want to have to do, uh, you don't have to do all the, you know, runs to the left side or, or you know, has it on the right wing or down in the low post on the left side or however you want right. to, to do it, or, uh, you know, baseball moves to his left, you know, whatever it is. Right. Um, you don't have to do that when you're watching on TV. So a lot of these guys are not all that descriptive, and, and uh, it's something that's hard for them to pick up because they just haven't haven't had the, the time and they haven't had the desire to, to listen to the radio. They want to see right. it. right. Um, when you're doing a TV game as opposed to a radio game, um, does that play into the factor of how you're calling the game, or, or do you do you call a game pretty much naturally at this point, and what comes out comes out? TV is always um, left-handed for me, okay, um, because I grew up doing radio. I didn't, you know, I I listened to the radio. I mean, I it, but when I was growing up, we had we got two radio uh, two TV stations where right. I lived, and right. we got the. Uh, ABC station at the time. Krim was the ABC station back okay. in the old days. And and Channel 6, which obviously always has been the NBC station. And so 
uh, when the uh, NFL was on CBS. I didn't get to see any of those games. So I didn't get to see the Rams or the 49ers right. or the Bears or the uh, the Lions, et cetera, et cetera. We only saw the AF, uh, AFL games, and then it became AFC, NFC, and we still didn't see the NFC until a, 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 a strong wind blew over the antenna. You know, I grew up out in the middle of nowhere, and right. there was an antenna there that served five families in the same little valley. And uh, when it blew down, we didn't have any TV for a year and a half because the wheat prices and the cattle prices <laughs> oh stunk. So nobody wanted to, to go you know, pay money for an antenna. And so we finally then, prices got better. They put up a better antenna. And so not only did we get the four stations out of Spokane because uh, the, the public station had signed on by that point in time, mm-hmm. uh, we also got the stations out of the Tri-Cities. There you now, go. they were all ABC, NBC, but occasionally, especially during the day, they'd do different things so you could see different programs. So, uh, you know, then we were we were in Fat City at that point. We got seven TV stations. Right. So if you wanted to follow a game, in all likelihood, you had to listen to the radio. And then I started doing radio games, and then I got into TV way late into this career, and it's just still left-handed, but I just, I, I've got to not talk as much. I have to let the, the, the analyst do the bulk of the work. I right. just tell people who has the ball and how many yards they got, and then the analyst can go, you know, fill in. I don't have to give them any visual pictures. They're seeing it. A picture's worth a thousand words. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, and some of the analysts that uh, that you have for these jobs um, are are better than others, obviously. And, and w- so when you get a partner that, that maybe you don't work with all the time, uh, what wh- how, how is that adjustment? I mean, obviously, um, you have a job to set them up and to d- detail what's going on. But do you find that with partners you have some of them you lead differently than others and give more information than others? Yeah, absolutely. There's You have to work with everybody a little bit differently. Paul Sorensen is the guy that I work with most. He does right. the Eastern football games with me. For, for better or worse. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the greatest book and league uh, football games with me. And, and Paul... Uh, I don't have to give him, he just jumps in. Right. I don't have to set him up too much with things, well, you know, that was a great run or whatever it is because he's going to hit on it. Yeah. But there are other guys that I might work with on a uh, more sparing basis that need to be set up. They'll just sit there if I don't set them up right. because they're used to, to having somebody to lead them into something. So, yeah, everybody is different, and sometimes it takes a little time to figure out what you have to do with, with each you know analyst. Who was your favorite broadcaster on the radio list growing up listening to? Bob Robertson, Washington State University broadcaster. Sure. I, I, I listened to Bob for years and years and years. And so when I went outside to throw the football to myself because I was an only child out in the middle of nowhere on the farm, right. I'd, you know, be broadcasting the game yeah. or out in the shop shooting baskets. I'd be broadcasting the game. And so um, Bob was the one that I uh, most often listened to. And so when I got my first opportunity to do this, I basically went out, I think, and just gave my best impersonation of Bob and right. hoped for the best. And it turned out okay. It's um, it, it's kind of amazing the folks that that um, that are in this profession, um, in sports, you know, with, uh, in the sports broadcasting profession in general, have a voice of play-by-play in their head, right? For me, it's John Miller because I grew up listening to him broadcast the Orioles games. So when I was in the backyard throwing throwing the baseball, in, you know, in, in my in my pitch machine, um, I was listening to John call my pitches, and it's it's interesting that that you say you heard Bob calling your play-by-play in your head. So I have a John Miller story for you. Great, let's hear it. Uh, that I have never told you before. So this is all new stuff. So the awesome. strike, 1994, the baseball strike. Right. Yeah, yeah, 94, I think it was. Um, and uh, uh, John's mother lived in Eugene. He was doing the Giants games right. by this point. And so he was visiting his mother in Eugene, and he just happened to turn on the radio, and he heard the guy doing the Eugene Emeralds games. Dennis Higgins was the guy's name. Okay. And Higgins was, was pretty good. And John thought, you know, this guy's pretty good. And so he came in and did a couple of games with Dennis just to listen more and, and do more. And that happened when Spokane, or excuse me, when Yakima was in town. So I was doing the Yakima games at okay. that point in time. So yeah, I've never been so green in envy, uh, <laughs> uh, green with envy in my life right. because there's John Miller next door. This guy's got access. I can't, I don't have that access. Right. You know, boy, and, and Dennis ended up getting a job with the Giants for a while based on what he did with John in that little time in Eugene. So, you know, it's sometimes it's just about, you know, funny breaks and, and yeah. you know, 
the baseball strike happens, so John comes to visit his mother, and he hears this guy and thinks he's pretty good and then goes in and auditions with him for a couple of games, and the guy ends up getting the Giants job for a couple of years. That's awesome, but i got to imagine it's just absolutely nerve-wracking, too. Oh, I, I would have been shaking in my boots <laughs> <laughs> to have a big league broadcaster sitting in there while you're, you know, and, and, you, and, and broadcasting with you. He's actually on the air. He's not just right. listening to you. I had... You know, a number of baseball guys sitting next to me, but none of them had a headset on, right. uh, with the exception of Tom Lasorda. So he was the only one that had a headset on when I was uh, when I was doing a game. Oh, you got to work with Tom Lasorda? Uh, well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we can leave Tom Lasorda out of the conversation, oh, no. I think. No, oh, no. I, I, my, my experience with Tom was not as uh, he, a tremendous manager, great guy. Um, but I was, uh, I, I, I was, I had the, the well, We'll go ahead and tell the story. I, I was the, I was the guy that ended. He, he, so he came to Yakima a few times because Yakima was part of the Dodgers organization, right? And so he always told the general manager, uh, a guy named Bob Romero, that he'd be happy to, you know, go sign autographs, go make appearances, whatnot, so sure. forth. But then he'd get there and he'd bitch and moan about having to go make the appearances, and he right. didn't like it. And I was the poor sap one year that had to take him oh, no. from point A to point B. And he'd do nothing but bitch and moan and carry on. And, oh, you don't have to do this and you have to do that. And I, I finally got tired of it after about three days. And I said, Mr. Lasorda, I, said, I didn't sign you. I didn't sell these things. I didn't. I'm just the poor. This isn't my fault. I'm just the poor blinkety blank, blank, blank that is having to ferry your blank, blank, blank ass around here. So, right. <laughs> <laughs> And so he went back to, to, to the general manager and he said, I don't want to go out with that guy anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so I got a little heat with Tom Lasorda. That's a, that's hysterical. Um, do you um, do you have a favorite sport to call? Baseball. Yeah, and and you don't get to do it all that often. No. Um, when you do get to do it, um, when when you get a chance to um, to fill in for Boyle uh, with the Indians, um, is it is it like slipping on a glove? Is it is it just it feels natural to you? takes a little time, yeah. actually, especially with all the changes in baseball over the last few years with sure. the pitch clock and the, uh, the things along those lines that speed up the game. You don't have nearly the time for stories mm -hmm. that you used to, to have. Sure. Um, and, and so that makes it a little bit different. It, it, you know, when you only do a, a game here and a game there, it's, it's, it's kind of hard. So I try to keep it really simple. Yeah. Uh, with how I do things, but yeah, because yeah, if you're not covering baseball on a daily basis, yeah. you don't know the players as well. Mm -hmm. You might not know them at all yeah. if you're only doing three or four games a year because the roster changes so frequently in in the low minor leagues. So yeah, I got to imagine that it's um, that it's tough just jumping back in like that. Yeah, I think it was 2022. Um, hockey had a pretty good run, mm -hmm. and Mike I think was gone for 13 of the first 18 games. I think for the Indians. So by the time I got to to game 13, I think I was doing okay. But, you know, when I fill in for a game here or a game there, I never really feel like I have my feet underneath me. It's just mm -hmm. I'm hoping for the best. Right. No, I, I totally get that. It's um, um, Baseball has a rhythm, a flow of its own, and part of the beauty of, of covering a team is that you're there every day and, you know, hanging out behind the, behind the batter's box or, you know, the batter screen mm -hmm. and getting able to talk to guys while they're in the middle of a slump or a hot streak or whatever it is without a microphone so you get to know them um, and that's, I think that's separate from any of the sports, right? Because most, most broadcasters aren't there for a basketball practice on a daily basis or they're, you know, they get limited access to the football team. But for baseball, at least in my experience, being able to be on the field, you know, during batting practice and, and getting with them afterwards, you get to know them um, and they get to know you. And that, that trust is, is ridiculously important when it comes to um, reporting on a team. And back when I was doing games, you also rode the bus with them. Right. So now they don't necessarily, the broadcasters usually don't ride the bus. They're uh, driving themselves because there's no room on the bus. But when, when I was with Spokane in 1989 and 1990, I think we had like 26 guys on the roster. So right. with three coaches and the trainer and myself. So there was enough room for everybody on one bus. Um Whereas now they've got, you know, 30 plus players and all these other coaches and hangers on and so forth. There's 40 some odd people on this bus now. So a lot of, some teams even take two buses right. instead of just one. So, uh, you know, that was a valuable time, too, to be sitting in front of somebody. And and he's got, you know, well, back in the day, a Walkman with, you know, whatever. And he's, well, listen to the, you know, what are you listening to? Well, I'm right. listening to 
You know, Ricky Davis was a pitcher for Spokane in 1980. Big Depeche Mode fan. I had never heard of <laughs> Depeche Mode right. in my life. And he said, here, listen to these guys. And I, oh. <laughs> after a few minutes, I handed them, to them well, aren't they great? And, yeah, they're not really my my thing there, right. Ricky. So. It's, uh, that, that's interesting when uh, um, you get to know players as people as opposed to yeah. just athletes. and. Um, you know, as storytellers, you verbally, me, writ, you know, written language, um, you try to capture their personalities as much as possible when you're telling these stories. Yeah, yeah, and, and it's much easier when you're sitting on a bus with somebody talking to them over a five or a six or a seven hour bus ride, or longer if you're headed to Medford from Spokane. Right. Um, you know, and that those were those were fun days. I enjoyed that. Now, I traveling these days isn't as much fun as it used to be just because, you know, when I went with for Boyle in, in 22, I made a couple of road trips while mm-hmm. I'm just on my own. Right. So it wasn't, it, it was harder to have the, the, the sense of, of belonging to a team. Sure. Totally get that. Um, I asked this question of you in the parking lot the other day, so I'm going to make you repeat it on tape now. Um, what is your least favorite sport to cover? Uh, I, I've never done it, but it would be soccer if I had to do it. Yeah, just because just, familiarity I, level? Yeah, I yeah. know nothing about soccer. We didn't play it. I didn't play it when we, there, we didn't have any teams when I was growing up mm-hmm. at that time. That, that you know, So, no, I never played it, and I've never really gotten into it. I know their strategy and so forth, but I've told the soccer coach at Eastern Washington, my strategy would be to kick it as far as you can and run as fast as you can after it. That would right. be, you know, I know they have plays and things. I just don't right. understand it. So. A lot of people do understand it, and they love the sport. And I just, you know, like a lot of people don't like baseball because it's too slow for them. Soccer, for me, is too slow. Yeah. But, you know, it's probably not any slower than baseball is. But you have broadcast almost every other sport, right? Just I have not broadcast hockey, but I've done baseball, basketball, football, obviously, bicycle racing, motorcycle racing, car racing, wrestling, volleyball, uh, and not pro wrestling, high school wrestling, right. volleyball, boxing, um, I'm sure there's one or two others in there that I've forgotten about, but I, I haven't done them all. They mm-hmm. wanted me one year at SWX. They were thinking about doing a roller derby. Okay. Uh, that would have been fun. And I would have, I was, but okay, I'll, I'll try that. And then the, the, they were going to do a pickleball tournament, and they had me signed up for that, and then something <laughs> happened, and that, that ended up falling through. Can't, so Can't imagine pickleball play-by-play. Play. I can't either, but I would have been, you know, okay, let's give it a shot, yeah, and we'll right. see what happens. I mean, I know nothing about auto racing either or bike you're, you're, racing you're or gonna whatever. You're going to pay me? But, let's try it. <laughs> right. You're going to pay me some money, so I'll, I'll go give it a <laughs> shot. I'll go give it a try, but I have no interest in trying soccer for whatever kind of money anybody's going to pay me. Yeah. I might try hockey at some point in time if I get the opportunity, but it would only be on TV because there's no way I could do hockey on radio. Right. There, there's there's a lot in hockey. Yeah. It's just constantly moving, and um, the guys are shuffling on and off every 30 seconds, and i got to imagine that's got to be just the toughest play-by-play to do. I would think so. On the radio, I think it would be very hard to do because you've got to edit at some point in time, and you have to know enough about the sport to know what you can edit and what you can't. And right. I'm not that, you know, the the Chiefs, or the Indians, the Chiefs wanted me to do the hockey in, in 9091, the year they won the Memorial Cup, mm-hmm. because I had done the baseball in 8990. They wanted to make it a full year round deal. And, and the trainer at the time for the Indians, they were the Padres farm club, is a guy named Keith uh, Duggar, who's the Colorado Rockies trainer right now. Okay. And so he and I were talking one day because he they he had gotten the offer to to be the trainer for both sports and I'd gotten the offer to do basket uh, basketball to do hockey and and baseball, and we were kind of you know talking it over a little bit and and I said I just don't know enough about hockey to do this and I don't want to wake up in Moose Jaw and you know the middle of January and forty below zero that would be right. my other problem with it and he's yeah so we both ended up turning it down and. Other people got it and did very well with it, and I'm happy for them, but I don't regret making that decision at all, even though it meant that I didn't do baseball anymore. Right. Well, that's, that's, that's sad that, uh, that, that you don't get the opportunity to do what, what, you, what you, you're, you're, you're calling. i got to imagine you think your calling is, is baseball radio and play-by-play yeah. play on the radio. Yeah, you know, I've, I've done Eastern for long enough that I, I, I think I made a good decision. I think yeah. I did. I did. I think the in the end it, it worked out the way it was supposed to work. I've I've enjoyed my my time with Eastern thirty four years. Hopefully there'll be a few more that we can add on to that. But you know, baseball always will hold a, a you know a, a, a big part of the 
my heart as well as far as broadcasting goes because it is still my favorite thing to do. But I've really enjoyed the Eastern football and basketball. And we've gone 20 minutes now. We haven't even mentioned Eastern Washington. <laughs> so perhaps it's a good time to pivot. But um, uh, Eastern Washington football, not so good this year. It's been tough because as we record this, they've lost six games. They probably should have won or at least could have won. Mm-hmm. Uh, and maybe you don't get all those wins, but maybe you're four and two in those games, and now you're six and three instead of sitting here two and seven going into your final three games of the year. Right. So, and, and it's been interesting because they've shot themselves in the foot in most of these games. It hasn't been physical mistakes, you know, with them turning the ball over or or things along those lines. It's been mental mistakes where they will execute a, a, a great play but then get called for a penalty that had really nothing to do with the play right. itself. Somebody's an illegal man downfield or whatever it might be, and they end up having to punt instead of continuing the drive, and then the other team scores, and so it basically becomes maybe a 10- or a 14-point swing. And if you have two or three or four of those plays over the course of a game, now you're looking at you know, they've, they've been able to be in every game they've played this year, with the exception of the Nevada game. And they probably, you know, if they had played a little cleaner football, would mm-hmm. be have a completely different record at this point in time. You know, it, it's amazing. You and I both see enough football games, you at the collegiate level or, and, and high school, and me at the high school level, that it really, it really, unless, unless one team just has absolutely just this much more talent than the other team, it really comes down to penalties and turnovers. Yeah. Almost, almost every week. Yeah, yeah the, the team that makes fewer mistakes is likely the team that's going to win. And it isn't the physical mistakes as much, I think, as it is the mental mistakes of, yeah. of just not being the, the— you know, one of Eastern's big problems this year defensively has been the guys that say, I'm going to go help these guys out because we need to make a play. Mm-hmm. Because they want to—you know, they, the, in, in the old— when I was playing high school football, we didn't know what our stats were. Right. The coaches didn't put them up. We didn't know if we were giving up. We could figure out how many points we were allowing because you could just get the final score. But right. the coaches never gave us the stats. We didn't know if we were allowing 200 yards a game rushing or, or right. you know, what it was. Now they can see it online. Plus, they've got people telling them in their social media, mm-hmm. you guys stink. Right. Or why do you, do you do that? You know, blah, blah, blah. And so... They want they they they're hypersensitive to all this stuff, and so that's been some of Eastern's problem as well. A cornerback, he's supposed to be covering the wide receiver across from him. Well, he thinks that maybe they're going to run, and so he's looking into the backfield. Mm-hmm. And you get one of the RPOs now, where the quarterback's reading the defense, and he puts the ball into the belly of the running back, and he sees the corner start to cheat in, and there goes the wide receiver down the field, and. Right. Now it's too late at that point in time. Your job was to cover that receiver, and you're trying to help out the guys on the defensive line and the linebackers to make this play when you needed to be sitting out here on your guy. That's the kind of mental mistake that Eastern's been making this year. And and you see it a lot that uh, um, that players try to do somebody else's job instead of their own. And and the the coaches put a lot of time and effort into drilling this stuff over and over and over and over again. But just for for a player to abandon it on the field, whether whether it's it's uh, it's overambitious or trying to make a play or or trying to pad their stats or whatever, um, that 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 guys just are not following what they are being supposed to be able to do. I really think that it's a chain. Everybody does their job, you have success. But if somebody misses their assignment in Mm -hmm. some way, shape, or form, then that just throws everything into chaos. And that's kind of been Eastern's problem this year. And it hasn't been, you know, uh, just guys trying to to, to be selfish. I think it's guys trying to contribute to the the team. And, you know, we want, we're good enough to win, but we're not winning. So I need to do more. Right. Well, no, you just need to do what you need to do. Yeah. But it's hard to to get that through, guys. When When you're talking about 75, 80 plays in a game, it's only three or four that are going south for Eastern. Right. They they beat Sacramento State in the middle of the season, right? They were ranked at the time. Um, that looked like it could give them some momentum going into that next gauntlet because they had UC Davis at six, they had Idaho, they met Montana State, but then going they, they drop all three of those games. But they're ten point games, so was, that speaks to your your thing that you you don't make a mistake here, and hey maybe it's a different game. Yeah, the the Davis game, the one of the plays that I was talking about where the corner peeked into the backfield, mm-hmm. uh, you know, that ended up being a 90-yard touchdown. Eastern had them at their own 10-yard line. It was, a, I think, a one-score game at that point in time, maybe a three-point or a seven-point game, and Davis gets a 90-yard touchdown pass out of it, and so now it's a two-score right. game. Uh, so th- those types of things have really hurt Eastern this year, and so um, 
You know, and I don't know how you, because the guys will drill that. They'll drill that in practice throughout the week, and people are doing it right. But then in the game, something yeah. happens, and I've, I've got to, you know, boy, this is a big, we got to stop him down here. We'll get the ball back in good field position, so I'm going to do whatever I can. But, yeah, you know. Yeah, just trying to do too much. Um, do they get better next year? You know, these days with NIL and free transfers, who knows? Because yeah. you just don't know who's going to, you know, if they return all the guys that are, good that should return yeah they should be better but we thought they were going to be better this year and they would have been had they not had you know all the self-inflicted wounds so will that still continue in 25 we don't know they're going to lose a really good player in Efton Chisholm Mm -hmm. Um, probably will end up as the second best wide receiver statistically as far as catches go in any way in Big Sky Conference history behind only Cooper Cup Mm -hmm. Um, you know you're losing him you're losing most of your offensive line which has been a strength of this team this year. But you do return some good players. Kekoa Vesperis at quarterback, Tuna Alta here at running back. Um, they've got some good wide receivers that will be coming back defensively. Derek Ganter Jr. at safety. Uh, they've got a really young secondary that all those guys are talented players that are going to be coming back. They've got some talented defensive linemen back. But, you know, will you just never know. Will the offer of a few thousand dollars and an opportunity maybe to go to a place that's winning more games, will that win out with some of these guys? You just don't know at this point in time. Right. It's like when uh when when I see folks over the summer and like, hey, who's gonna win the football league this year? I'm like, I won't know until I see him. <laughs> you just don't know who's transferring in and out of districts as far as the high school goes. Right. Uh, there's guys changing teams. Yeah. So it, it's hard to, to to figure at this point in time. Um basketball season starting. Um, Eastern's got practically a completely new roster. Uh, obviously, the brand—I say brand new coach—is the new old coach. Um, <laughs> what do you see on the horizon for them this year? You know, I, I, it's going to be very interesting because they have six players back from last year. Two of them were red shirts that didn't play at all. Mm-hmm. One was a red shirt who played in two games and was injured. And the other three guys, one played 32 games, all 32 games, averaged about 12 minutes a game. The other two played roughly half the schedule. One played 17 games out of 32. The other guy played 14 out of 32. They returned less than 8% of their scoring from last year wow. and just over 10% of their minutes played. And so there's very few guys with Division One experience. Um, it's going to be an interesting team to watch. I think it's going to be a very different Eastern team. If you've been an Eastern basketball fan, going back, you know, even back to, to Ray Jackaletti's time, it was not an athletic team. They were um, a very smart team. They were, uh, in that particular case, a very good defensive team. But they uh, they didn't rely too much on the three-point shot, which is something this team will not do. As they'll, they'll be very much a two-point scoring team. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it hasn't been a team that's that's had, you know, a lot of long arms and, and guys in passing lanes and creating turnovers and so forth. I think this team could be a team that's really good defensively but really good in creating turnovers and then getting out in the fast break and turning those uh, mistakes into points. So it's, I think it's going to be really interesting to watch this team this year to see how much of a different team it is than what we've seen in the past here. There's no dominant big man on this team, mm-hmm. so there's no Tanner Groves, there's no Mason Peatling, there's right. no Jake Wiley, there's no Vanky Joyce, all these names that Eastern fans will be familiar with. Right. Um, but I think it's going to be a very different team because I think they're really going to get after people and get in passing lanes and get steals and, and cause havoc uh, defensively. Um, were you surprised at the coaching hire? A little bit, but not 100% okay. surprised by it because Dan Munson is a, still a big name in, in college basketball. Right. And, he, and he wanted to end his career differently than the way it ended for him at Long Beach State. Even if he doesn't get to an NCAA tournament at Eastern, he wants to end it on his terms. Yeah, because that was a weird situation at the end of the season. Yes, that was a very weird situation where he was fired but was still coaching his team, and they made it to the NCAA tournament, Yeah, kind of rallied around him. A little bit. So when it came time with the Eastern opening, when Dave Riley went down to, to WSU, uh, I had received a couple of phone calls from people who uh, were very interested in, in seeing if I could help Coach Munson get hired. And, and I didn't. I stayed completely neutral and out of it. Right. But there, I, I'm sure there was some promise of, of money from Gonzaga Boosters that, hey, if you hire, you know, I'll give you $1,000 or I'll give you, you know, 500 or 5000 or whatever the dollar figure might have been. We'll right. pledge this if you hire this guy. 
and maybe there weren't. But I think that was a, a possibility. And, and Eastern, with limited budgets and, and needing cash, maybe that, uh, that helped out. But, you know, Coach Munson's history and the fact that he's won almost 450 college basketball games right. – you know, that's the, nobody else applied for the job that has the, the track record that he has. So whether yeah. money or not was a, was a part of it. Coach's track record was definitely a part of it, and he's won at every stop that he's, that he's had. Some have had more success than others, but he's won at every stop that he's had. So, um, I, I you know, I think it's a good hire. Um, at 63, he is uh, not a, a young man anymore in, right. in uh, probably the most challenging time for – college basketball coaches because of that free transfer in the NIL and things along those lines. Right. But he seems to be having a, a, a boil of fun at coaching this team <laughs> and, and is enjoying it, and good for him. I'm, we're happy to have him here. That was the thing that raised my eyebrow about the thing is that um, it seems like that, that, for better or worse, Eastern Washington is a stepping stone for a lot of folks. Um, and to have a experienced – 63 year old coach come in here I would have expected the other end of the spectrum have you know 35 year old you know assistant you know graduate assistant wizard that type of thing come in and take over that over a growing program as opposed to having an experienced coach come in to take over a team like you, you mentioned the talent dream that we've seen the last four or five years there was no logical successor for Eastern at Dave Riley, for Dave Riley, which is uh, uh, different than what they had in the last couple of coaches. Jim yeah. Hayford came in. He had Dave Riley, he had Shante Leggins, and he had others as part of his staff. He right. had Chris Victor, who's the head coach at Seattle University now. He had Alex Pribble, who's the head coach at the University of Idaho now. He had Leggins, who's now at the University of Portland. He had Dave Riley, who's now at WSU. So when Hayford left to go to Seattle U, then it was the logical, uh, logical progression was Shante mm -hmm. coming in to take over uh, the men's basketball pro program. When Shantae left to uh, go to Portland, the logical procession, uh, progression was then to Dave. Right. But Dave didn't have that next guy that had been around for six or eight or ten years. Those mm -hmm. guys left to go with Shantae down to Portland. Gotcha. So uh, you know, there was no, you know, the, I think the longest tenured assistant at Eastern had been two years. Hmm. And I think most of those guys were only around for a year because right. the, the staff was cycling through. So there was no just obvious successor within the program, and so then you, you look outward, and, and I know a lot of people applied, and, and Coach Munson is the one that won. I think it's a good choice. We'll see what happens this year. We'll see what happens with him through his career. I think he's having a ball. He's got a son as an assistant coach and mm -hmm. a son as a player. Well, there you go. So as a coach, he didn't get to, you know, go watch his sons play in high school a whole lot. He didn't right. get to go watch, you know, maybe as much as he'd like. So now he's got him around him here with this, and so I think this is a great situation for, for Coach. Cool. Um, just a couple of minutes left here. I uh, want to talk about doing the GSL game of the week because obviously I get to come in and sit, sit with you to do that and get to come on every once in a while. Um, how much fun is it for you to be able to go and call high school games and, and, and be part of bringing that uh, aspect of the game to Spokane? I love it. I mean, I started out doing high school games, so mm -hmm. I think it's, it's great. I enjoy seeing it, and we have some fantastic facilities from which to broadcast mm -hmm. in this community. One Spokane Stadium, fantastic. Union Stadium, the new new stadium at Ridgeline, CV, U-High, all good places mm -hmm. to call a game. So it's not like you've got to go out like I did in 1980 and sit on a scaffold in Deer Park to, right. you know, in 30-degree weather with snow flying and wind blowing to, to broadcast a game to the point where the now white – beard and mustache you're seeing was at that point of more of a brown but it was also white because of the ice from my nose running and, and right. uh so uh, you know it, it we, we've got the great facilities here so it's not like it's hard work I, i'm not calling a game from the back of a pickup truck which i've done on more than one occasion right not sitting on the scaffold doing the game in 30 degree weather with snow flying so uh it, it, it's much more comfortable surroundings to do the games and and you know it's good football in, in the GSL, good basketball mm -hmm. in the GSL. We have some nice gymnasiums to, to, to call a game in, in as well. So I, I love it. I, I, we've done it now for, oh gosh, probably 15, 16 years. So it's, it's, it's been a lot of fun, and, and I'd like to continue to do that as long as I can as well. Has there been somebody that you saw in high school, either football or basketball, and you saw them as a high school player, and automatically a bell went off to say, this kid's going to play at the next level, or this kid could even be a pro? Oh, gosh. I mean, yeah, Anton Watson would be one that would, you know, jump to the head just because he's he's one of the more recent guys right. like that. And there's been the other way, too, where I've seen guys 
and they go to college and oh, what did you see in that guy? Yeah. And they've had great success. Mm-hmm. The Groves brothers yeah. would come to that. I saw them yeah. in high school, and I didn't think that they were Division One guys, but they were both really good Division One guys, right. and they're both playing professionally now. So what do I know? Well, you know? It, it's funny to see that development, right? I mean, yeah. pe- people develop at d- different stages, um, especially, I think, in basketball, because uh, these kids that, 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 that grow six inches between freshman and sophomore, freshman and junior year, they're still trying to grow into their feet, and there is, you know, it takes a little bit of time for that uh, that aspect of the physicality to catch up with the with the player. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, guys grow. It takes a while for them to to get coordination if they have a big growth spurt. Um, and you know what? Even within just your high school program, it's different. So much of basketball now, and this is where I I didn't get to see either Tanner or Jake was in the AAU. Mm-hmm. Shante Leggins told me, he says, you haven't seen these guys in the summer. I've seen these guys yeah. in the summer. I know what they're like against top competition. Right. They're better than, than, than what they're showing in high school. And sure enough, you know, Legs was right and I was wrong. And I'm, <laughs> I'm used to being wrong and I was used to him being right. And I'm used to Coach Riley and all these other guys being right and, and me being wrong. But they get to see these guys yeah. more often than I get to see them. It's like Mike Rizzo once said, if you knew anything about it, you'd be in the game. Exactly. And I, I've figured out that I don't know anything about it. I've, I've, I've told Aaron Best, no. I've told some of these other coaches, if I was coaching, we'd be Owen, whatever it was. No. I think I know what I, I I think I can see a player and say whether they can play or not, but you know I'm wrong on that probably <laughs> as often as I'm right. So uh, it, it's a little bit of a humbling experience when you're you know when when you when you think you have an idea of what's mm-hmm. happening and it turns out maybe you really don't. Well, uh, you do. I mean, <laughs> you uh, you've become a trusted voice. Uh, uh, I should say, become a trusted voice. You are a trusted voice in Spokane, uh, bringing us Eastern Washington football and basketball. Obviously, the voice of the the Greater Spokane League. So, um, it's uh, um, it's an honor to have you on. I'm, I'm, I was happy when you said yes, you'd do this. I I kind of figured we'd have a half hour of uh, uh, you know BSing a little bit, but I, I think this uh, this was really good. So, thank you for coming on today. My pleasure, Dave. Always uh, happy to do this. I- I enjoy talking to you, whether it's here in this situation or at the ball games that we're covering. Oh, so, or in the parking lot afterwards. Or in the parking lot afterwards off. while we're freezing our butts off in the middle of the winter. So awesome. We're, well, we're in the late, late in the fall in this situation. He's Larry Weir, the voice of Eastern Washington uh, football and basketball. My name is Dave Nichols. Thank you for joining us on the Press Box podcast, and we'll see you next week.